Let's start off by reading through this passage from Act 1, Scene 1 of Ben Johnson's Volpone. Volpone, good morning to the day, and next, my gold. Open the shrine that I may see my saint. Hail the world's soul and mine. More glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed-for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram, am I to view thy splendor, darkening his. That lying here, amongst my other hordes, showest like a flame by night, or like the day struck out of chaos, when all darkness fled unto the center. O thou son of soul, but brighter than thy father, let me kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Well did wise poets, by thy glorious name, title that age which they would have the best, thou being the best of things, and far transcending all style of joy in children, parents, friends, or any other waking dream on earth. Thy looks, when they to Venus to describe, they should have given her twenty thousand cupids, such are thy beauties and our loves. Dear saint, riches, the dumb god that givest all men tongues, that canst do not, and yet makest men do all things, the price of souls, even hell, with thee to boot, is made worth heaven. Thou art virtue, fame, honor, and all things else. Who can get thee? He shall be noble, valiant, honest, wise. Mosca. And what he will, sir, riches are in fortune a greater good than wisdom is in nature. So first of all, you probably noticed right away that a lot of the spelling is different from the modern English spelling that you're used to. Most of the words, however, are fairly easy to figure out because they're phonetically similar to their modern counterparts, which you know quite well. Once you looked at them and said them to yourself, you probably found that you could pretty well understand all the words that Valpone says, even if they look different. One word that might have confused you on the first read-through is the word then, T-H-E-N, which is the spelling in this passage for the word that we spell T-H-A-N. Secondly, you should have noted as you read that the big idea here in this excerpt is that Volpone really likes something. That's expressed through all this metaphor and personification and imagery that Volpone uses throughout the passage. So with that in mind, let's get to the questions. The first question will settle for us exactly what it is that Volpone loves so very much. Question one. Throughout the passage, Volpone is addressing what? Right in the first line, Volpone addresses two different entities. Good morning to the day, he says, and then he follows it up with his next greeting. And next, my gold. So he's clearly addressing his gold immediately after he addresses the day. Then he goes on to say, open the shrine that I may see my saint. We can assume that the saint here is his gold, and he goes on some more and says, hail the world's soul and mine. So whatever he's addressing, he's calling it the soul of the world and his own soul as well. He says that the teeming earth peeps through the horns of the celestial ram to see the longed for sun. And he says that the splendor of whatever he's addressing darkens the sun, or we can conclude is brighter than the sun. Then he calls whoever or whatever it is, the son of soul or the son of the sun, because soul is the Latin word for sun, as well as the name of more than one sun god, but he says again that whoever, whatever he's addressing is brighter than the sun itself. Next he says, let me kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Going on down to lines 21 through 23, he names the object of his address, dear saint, riches, the dumb god that gives all men tongues that can do naught or nothing and yet makes men do all things. Based on continuity from the first line and the language he's using, treasure, riches, brighter than the sun, he never stops addressing his gold once he begins. So it looks as if C is the best response, but let's take a look at all of the answers just in case. A. Mosca. Mosca speaks at the end, but based on the continuity going forward from Volpone's address to next my gold in line one, as well as the kinds of comparisons and the language that Volpone uses throughout the passage, there's no reason to think that he's talking to Mosca. Also, notice that Mosca, when he speaks, shows that he is also quite fond of riches too, so he adds his similar sentiment to what Volpone is saying, rather than respond with any kind of acceptance of Volpone's adoration. So A is not a supportable answer, and we can eliminate it. 
be the sun. No, he clearly says that whatever he is addressing is brighter than the sun or soul, so it can't be the sun. See his gold. As we saw, this response is well supported by the passage. D, his beloved. There is no indication from the passage that he is speaking about a person when he clearly addresses next my gold in line one. If you want to say that his gold is his beloved in some sense, then C is still a better and clearer answer, so no to D. E himself. No, he talks about kissing whatever it is he's addressing, as well as saying things like, thou canst do not, to the object in question, and he, Volpon, is obviously doing something. He's making a speech to whatever it is. He calls the object dumb, meaning that it cannot speak, and again, Volpon himself is making a speech. He's obviously not dumb. So, he can't be talking about himself, so eliminate E. And, of course, the best answer is C, his gold. Question two, which of the following adjectives best describes Volpone's speech? A, ironic. Volpone is, as far as we can tell, being perfectly sincere here. He's not being verbally ironic by saying the opposite of what he means, so this isn't a supportable answer. B, idolatrous. So an idol is something that someone worships in place of a true God or deity, and idolatrous is treating something or someone as if it's an idol. Volpone talks about opening the shrine that I may see my saint and asks permission to kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Associating all this religious imagery with his gold certainly qualifies as idolatrous, so this is a very well-supported answer. Also, you might notice that kissing with adoration every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room is employing Roman Catholic imagery. Even if you didn't know that, however, the words shrine and saint and sacred and blessed are all words that are associated with other religions and worship in general, so this answer is accessible even if you aren't familiar with Roman Catholic relics and practices such as adoration. So, this answer is very supportable. C. Mendacious. This means lying or not telling the truth. As far as we know, Volpone is telling the truth as he sees it. We certainly don't have any reason to think otherwise, so no to mendacious. D. Understated. There is no way that we can consider this overwhelmingly over-the-top praise to his gold as understated. This is much more like hyperbole or overstatement, so we can get rid of D. E. Devious. This carries with it the idea of doing something underhanded or sneaky, so that doesn't fit either. And of course, the best answer is B, idolatrous. Question three. In the simile in line eight, night is used to stand for what? Let's read over that line and the context, and we'll go ahead and start with line one so we can get the full picture of what he's saying. Good morning to the day and next my gold. So as we saw, he's talking to his gold. Open the shrine that I may see my saint. Hail the world's soul and mine. So he's hailing his gold, much like one would say, hail the king, and he's calling it the soul of the world, and his own soul as well. Then he goes on to say, More glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed-for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram. And this refers to the ram that Jason got the golden fleece from, if you ever heard that story. We get the astrological sign Aries based on this ram. Am I to view thy splendor darkening his? That lying here amongst my other hordes showest like a flame by night or like the day struck out of chaos when all darkness fled unto the center. So notice what he's saying in somewhat simplified terms. More glad than the earth is to see the sun peeking through the horns of the heavenly ram am I to see your splendor darkening the sun's splendor. That lying here amongst my other hordes or bunch of possessions shows like a flame in the night. Rearranging the syntax for clarification, he's saying, I am more glad to see your splendor darkening the sun's splendor than the earth is to see the sun peeking through the horns of the celestial ram. Your splendor lying here amongst my other possessions shows like a flame in the night. So, if his gold splendor, as it lies among his other possessions or hordes, is being compared to a flame by night, then the gold would be the flame and the possessions or hordes would be the night. So E, Volpone's possessions that are not made of gold, is a very well-supported answer. If you look through the rest of the answers after following the grammar and logic here, chaos, the source of Volpone's riches, the evil that wealth can make people commit, Volpone's dark robes, 
you'll see that none of these choices are supportable at all. And the correct answer is, of course, E, Volpone's possessions that are not made of gold. Question four. The phrase, that age which they would have the best, line 15, refers to what? So let's read the line in the context. Well did wise poets by thy glorious name title that age which they would have the best. So if the poets titled or gave a title to an age or time period by the glorious name of gold, obviously he's talking about D, the golden age. And that makes sense because typically when you read about a golden age of a country or culture or anything else, the term refers to its best time period. The rest of these answers don't make sense because he says that wise poets titled the age by thy glorious name, and we know that he's talking to his gold. So we can cross out all the other answers and choose D, the golden age, is the only answer that fits here. Question 5. Lines 22 and 23 are based on which of the following? So the lines in question read, Riches the dumb God that givest all men tongues, that canst do not, and yet makest men do all things. And now let's look at our choices. A. Paradoxical hyperbole. So remember that hyperbole is extreme exaggeration or overstatement, and a paradox is something that is contradictory or seemingly contradictory, but that might, once understood, reveal truth. Here we have, riches the dumb God that givest all men tongues, and that can do not, and yet makest men do all things. So he speaks of riches as a God, and he says it gives the tongue to all men, and it makes men do all things. That's clearly hyperbole, since it's an exaggeration to say that it gives tongue to all men, that it's a God, and it makes men do all things. We know, for example, that some people don't have money, and that people have the ability to express themselves without money, that money is not men's motivation for everything, and that money is not really a God. So we have hyperbole. Then we notice that he says riches cannot speak, it's dumb, and yet it gives tongue or speech to men. Riches can do naught or nothing itself, yet it makes men do all things. So speechless, it causes speech. And unable to do anything, it makes others do everything. This is certainly paradoxical, so paradoxical hyperbole is a very well-supported answer. B. Mixed metaphors. So we do have a metaphor. Riches is referred to as a god. But there's no mixed metaphor because giving men speech and making men do all things are both actions consistent with the metaphor of a god. So there's no mixing going on here, and this answer is insupportable. C. Syllogism. A syllogism is a term used to refer to a form of reasoning where a conclusion is drawn from premises, such as the premises that all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, leading to the conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. We don't have anything like that here. We don't have premises that lead us to a conclusion, so we can cross out C. D, circular reasoning. This refers to a fallacious type of argument where you assume that the thing you're trying to prove is true and make it a part of your premise. For example, you might say, all knowledge is scientific because all non-scientific claims are not really knowledge. This is not what's going on in this passage, so let's get rid of D. E, dramatic irony. Remember that dramatic irony refers to a situation in which the audience or reader has knowledge of which the characters are unaware. This doesn't apply at all here. So we can cross out E, and the best response is A, paradoxical hyperbole. Question 6. In line 24, to boot means what? So let's check out that line in its surrounding context. Dear Saint, riches, the dumb God that gives to all men tongues that can do not and yet makes men do all things. The price of souls, even hell with thee to boot is made worth heaven. So remember that he's talking to his gold and he's praising it. He calls it a dear saint and a god and he ascribes powers to it. It gives all men tongues and makes men do all things. He calls it the price of souls and then he goes on to say that even hell with gold to boot is made worth heaven. So this is a kind of culmination of all these positives about gold. So let's plug in all the choices and see which one makes sense. A. Even hell with gold to reckon with is made worth heaven. So if hell has to reckon with gold, it means hell has to take gold into account. This seems to imply that gold is a part of hell already. Even hell, if you take gold into account, is made worth heaven. 
Well, gold isn't typically something that we think of as being a part of hell that hell has to take into account. So this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Let's cross out A and move on to B. B, even hell with gold to pay is made worth heaven. So if hell has gold to pay, hell is worth heaven. No, this doesn't make sense either. Cross out B. C, even hell with gold to own is made worth heaven. Well, this doesn't make a lot of sense just as a sentence. If hell has gold to own, then hell owns gold, which is how you would say it rather than saying it has it to own. If hell owns gold, then there is gold in hell, and maybe gold would make hell worth as much as heaven. But if that's the case, there's an answer here that's better. So let's put to own aside and go on to the last two answers. D, even hell with gold instead is made worth heaven. Instead of what, though? If hell had gold instead of something, this doesn't make sense. E, even hell with gold in addition is made worth heaven. This is much better. With the addition of gold, even hell is worth heaven. This makes sense, and it is, in fact, the meaning of the idiom to boot. So even if you're not familiar with to boot, you would still be able to go through these choices and come to the correct conclusion that the only answer that makes sense in the context of the sentence is E in addition. Question 7. Which of the following best paraphrases lines 26 or 27? Who can get thee, he shall be noble, valiant, honest, wise. So since he's addressing his gold, the the here is referring to gold or riches. So who can get gold or riches? He shall be noble, valiant, honest, wise. Keeping that in mind, let's look at the answers. A, it is better to be noble, valiant, honest, and wise than to have riches. No, he says that whoever gets riches shall be all these things. So he isn't saying it's better to be these things than it is to have riches. Apparently, to Volpone, acquiring riches gold leads to these characteristics, so we can cross out A. B, a rich person will be esteemed, noble, valiant, honest, and wise. Esteemed here is like considered or believed to be. So this answer follows in the correct order. Riches come first, and then others consider the rich person to be all these characteristics. Even though the passage says, he shall be all these things, rather than he shall be esteemed all these things, this still can work logically. After all, if you are all those things, people will likely know it and esteem you as such. Let's check out the rest of the answers and see if there's anything better though. C, a virtuous person is likely to become wealthy as well. This isn't the correct order. In Volpone's statement, acquiring the riches precedes possessing the characteristics, so this isn't the best answer. D, Nobility, valor, honesty, and wisdom will make a person happy. No, in the lines in question, acquiring riches leads to nobility, valor, honesty, and wisdom. There isn't even a mention of happiness, and certainly not that these characteristics lead to happiness. They might, but Valpone doesn't mention it. He is focused on the effects of acquiring gold rather than the effects of acquiring these characteristics. So this answer can't be supported. Cross out D. E, getting riches may cause a person to disregard nobility, valor, honesty, and wisdom. No, certainly not. If you can get riches, Volpone attests, you will be noble, valiant, honest, and wise, not disregarding of those characteristics. So this answer won't work either. And of the choices that we have, B, a rich person will be esteemed, noble, valiant, honest, and wise, is the most supportable one. Question 8. Mosca's comment Riches are in fortune a greater good than wisdom is in nature, in lines 28 and 29, does which of the following? So looking at our answers, we have A, asserts that riches are the equivalent of wisdom. Notice that Mosca says that riches are a greater good than wisdom. So we can't say that riches are the equivalent of wisdom. Cross out A. B implies that acquiring riches is more natural than acquiring good fortune. So Mosca says that riches are in fortune a greater good than wisdom is in nature. Notice that he's saying that if your fortune includes riches, that's better than if your nature includes wisdom. So he's not saying that acquiring riches is more natural than acquiring good fortune. That's not how he's using nature here. We can get rid of B. C compares fortune to riches. 
No, he's comparing wisdom to riches, not fortune to riches. So this answer can go to cross out C. D suggests that wisdom can add riches to nature. Now, this is really convoluted. He says that riches are a greater good in fortune than wisdom is in nature, so he never associates wisdom with riches except by this contrast. Wisdom doesn't add riches to nature. Cross out D. E contrasts a gift conferred by fortune with a gift conferred by nature. Yes, absolutely. He contrasts riches, which come with a person's fortune, with wisdom, which comes from a person's nature. Notice that even if you are confused about what is meant by nature here, you still could not follow the logic of any of the other answers and choose any of them. E is the only answer that works logically here, so that fact itself should clarify for you how nature is being used in the passage. E is a very supportable answer, and it is the correct one. Question 9. Which of the following is used most extensively in the passage? A. Religious language. There is certainly an abundance of religious language in this passage. We have the language of the Roman Catholic religion, as well as imagery not specifically associated with Roman Catholicism, such as sacred, shrine, blessed, heaven, hell, saint, etc. And then, on top of that, we have a reference to Venus and Cupid, both of which are Roman deities, and the celestial realm, which references Greek religious mythology. So this is a really supportable answer. B. The language of finance. While the passage does speak of riches and gold, it doesn't employ the language of finance to do so. So cross out B. C. Pastoral imagery. Pastoral refers to an idealized imagery of country life, particularly land used for grazing sheep and cattle. A ram is mentioned, which is a sheep, but not in the context of grazing or idealized country life, and there's nothing else that could apply at all, so we can eliminate C. D. Animal imagery. The only animal mentioned here is the celestial ram in line 5, and this hardly qualifies as extensive use of animal imagery. So, let's get rid of D. E. Images of disorder. While Volpone does reference chaos here, in the context, it's being driven out by the light of the sun, or the darkness is being driven out by the light of the sun. Other than that, there aren't really any other references that can be considered images of disorder, so this answer is not supportable. And of course, the best answer is A religious language.